Yep, there she is. Somehow Lara Croft still hasn't been killed or arrested, and she's still wreaking havoc in historical places all around the world. This time it's some business about an ancient Polynesian meteor and four fragments that were carved into artifacts around the world that might have some superpowers and that... Uh, hang on, Lara. I've actually been doing some research into where the other artifacts are and made some maps, if you think that might save us some time. A commendable work ethic, I guess. I'm flattered. Nice, that's what I thought too. Alright, let's do it. It's part three, baby! The third chapter! Oh, part three, baby! Tomb Raider, part three. Whew, I've talked about this level twice already, so let's be brief. We can finally get a hold of our pistols in the training area, and Jeeves is prepared accordingly. The guns require one of our new moves, an extremely slow crawl. There's also a new sprint with a meter that'll be needed for some of the game's crueler puzzles. A couple of puzzles in the house. The first is Lara's home museum. We can find a button in the pool room to open a hidden door in the entrance hall, and by properly applying our new sprint, we can explore her various treasures from days past. The other begins in the attic, but not through the main way. Lara's library fireplace hides a ladder to a lever that opens a door on the first floor with a strict timer. Down here is a secret underground aquarium where Lara conveniently keeps the key to her personal quad bike course in the yard. She likes to challenge herself at home. The quad bike's fun to tool around on, but we can't take it onto the proper grounds without a little bit of exploitation. Lara can also do monkey bars now. And speaking of monkeys, it's time for the real deal. Lara picks the biggest, muddiest hill in India and disembarks at the top. Right away, we can choose to blindly slide forward, or we can carefully scrabble down around Lara's left to get a little more preview of the hill ahead. Both choices distract us from the first secret mere steps away, under the canopy invisible only from below, a nice early shotgun. Midway down the hill is a bank of spikes and a branch upon which we may survey the challenges ahead with a monkey friend. There are a couple of runaway truck ramps on either side we can aim for further down, taking care to avoid the trailing boulder, and on the left we can jump around to another branch with the second secret. Note that if we miss these hill secrets, there's no getting back up. Finally, past one more cinematic spike pit is the bottom. Echoing Tomb Raider 1, our destination is already nearby early in the level, but a barrier forces us to take the long way around. In this case, the quicksand can't be crossed safely, so instead we must ford the river. But before fording, more exploring. The top of the mudslide area reveals a third secret in the waterfall channel. No more dragons this game, by the way. The secrets vary per level in number and reward. Moving on, the river's strong current means we need to go over the top. Exploring the stone courtyard right at the foot of the hill leads to a lever controlling a gate to our first trap room off said courtyard. We enter on the left, pull a lever to our right, and hide in the alcove behind while the spiked wall shifts in response. This reveals a hole behind the wall with a zipline across the water. On the other bank, the clearing holds our first deadly opponent, a Bengal tiger. There's a lever inside a hollowed out tree that opens an uphill gate and unleashes the nearby boulder while startling you with the world's loudest noise. For unknown reasons, the uphill gate merely hides another lever that opens another gate kitty corner to the first one, but we advance past more tigers. Let's avoid the foggy spike hole of death for now and crawl under the log, go around and fight our way up the log, and in the tall room, climb our way carefully up to a high hall with a lever and an ominous overhead boulder. You might also notice a slick little secret next to the boulder up here before sprinting back down to avoid the inevitable trap. Back at the bottom, there's a well-hidden secret in the log, again reminding me of Tomb Raider 1's caves hidden in plain sight, before we drop down and bounce our way out of a spike trap. The big gate down here is open thanks to our climb earlier, so we move on to another shroomy jungle clearing. This time, boulders emerge from behind Flora to surprise us. There's also a pretty well-hidden secret behind the Flora, under the Flora, when discovered by accident, it seems like a trap, but by hanging and safely dropping into the corner of the spikes, we can find another alcove. Again, tough stuff for level 1. Ahead, we spy the river again, and we can use the floating log to climb up to a branch with another lever. That opens a door off along the rocks, and we can go up and over the earlier stretch of the river to a new zip line, leading to a waterfall cave. It's dry initially, but past the tigers in these two pool rooms, we can swim between a series of four levers and pull our first block to flood the main cavern. By swimming across, we can reach a ladder to throw a final high lever and unlock the underwater route near the exit. Atop a ladder there, in the temple, is the Indra Key and the path to the exit ahead. We're in Snake Country. The gate to a trap door hides in the long grass. We can go underground and find more water. In this level, the water is infested with piranhas, so we can't safely go in deeper than our ankles, so use caution jumping across the stone pillar. The waist-high water is just enough to keep Lara alive so we can pull the lever and frantically swim through the underground tunnel to safety. Here we scramble up the mudslide to reach a high balcony, 
and emerge on more branches. We need to make our way around the upper ledges of the waterfall to another snake pit leading down to the actual temple. Hey statue, behind a block is a crawl space to a collapsed room, the room of my childhood nightmares. At the top of the hill are two levers, one of which opens the hall to this monkey sauna. In this back room, two flamethrowers dissuade us from pulling the lever between them, but we can just fit between the fumes and then swim through the gate. Swim off-center to avoid the darts, and cautiously to avoid the collapsing rocks, before climbing out and up onto the high ledges. High ledges beget higher ledges, and just after the elevated snake we must be ready to either rush through the final jump or drop back and hang because the entrance is rigged with a boulder. There's a pushable block in the corner here that's easily missable, and there's a sort of random scattering of subsequent blocks we need to push in order to reach a lever for a gate in the monkey sauna. On our way out, we can drop down the entrance side of the large pit past the traps and find a small alcove that circles back to the high ledges. Back in the monkey sauna, we hit the underwater lever on the side and swim into the opposite alcove to get a key. Back in the statue room, down on the floor is another switch to proceed alongside another unmarked movable block hiding a secret. Moving on, we have a rather unpleasant quicksand hallway where we just have to trust that Lara will emerge and breathe again before the end. A vertical U-turn leads back to a lever opening a time trap gauntlet requiring a sprint and roll through it. We can open the second floor door with a lever and pull out a movable block to reach it, also allowing us to reach a ladder hole in the ceiling with secret number three. Through the central hole, an underwater lever leads to a brief underwater sequence with two levers at opposite ends of the room. Up top we get another water puzzle, this time pulling three levers in sequence to squeeze through a gate and get another key. On the surface of the upper pool, we can look closely at the unusually positioned flamethrowers and spot the faint invisible platforms overhead, allowing us to reach a lever above the water for the back of the room. This is like a little saw trap. We run down here toward the looming spike wall, hit the switch in order to reveal another key, sprint down and get it just before we roll and retreat to the door just in time. Back across the mud, up the hill and to the right, are a series of short tunnels with another boulder trap. At the end to the right, we can drop all the way down carefully and use our keys of Ganesha to find another spiked wall, this time coming down vertically with our exit atop the ladder. We pull a dull block in the next room to reach levers on the rafters, lure the boulder out, sneak past the flamethrower, and prepare to fight two more living statues. This time we're given their scimitars upon defeat, which go into the hands of this guy up here. This opens the fairly direct route to the more sinister inner sanctum. Rory dropped a key. Another key is in the dark hallway, down in a hole we reach by frantically pulling two switches as the ceiling descends once again. In the back corner near the corpses is a flooded room with a spike wall and a current. Both levers kill the current and yield a key. With the three additional keys, we can finally open the exit. The River Ganges. It's pretty polluted, so try not to fall in. Right away we can spy our new toy, the quad bike. While it is tempting to rev it up and over the natural ramp across the river dead ahead, let's remember our snowmobile excursion in Tomb Raider 2 and discover the handholds on the near cave wall first, leading to several chaotic jumps down the tunnel for a well-earned secret along the water. And then we gotta repeat it all backwards. Then we jump. Then we drive and stop at the second jump and do basically the same thing on this pit wall for a second secret. Then we jump. Then we turn and jump. And turn and jump. Now there's a gate, but we can spot a tunnel to the other side of that last jump and jump through to some snake tunnels where we can drop down the other side of the gate and open it. Now we are faced with the rare diverging path choice in Tomb Raider, the high road or the low road. We'll miss a secret by taking the low road though, so as far as I'm concerned, it's no choice at all. The high road continues through the mud along a precarious path past pit and corner to a rock bridge above the river with a small secret off to the side. Further along, we hit a rock wall, and there's a little goat trail up the face and around to some quite unpleasant heights for our bike, punctuated by a nasty jump past the canopy. From there, we can cross the river again above a big rocky hill and dismount to find a high path on foot above the hill leading to a secret cave. Down the hill is where the low road from before reconvenes, and that's all for the bike right now. To briefly recap the low road, across the river and down along this building is an open space with some high tree branches and ledges, leading to a small shrine in the corner holding a gate key. Outside through a small crawl space is another gate key, and in the lower part of this shrine is a button to open some gates. We would have driven our bike down and jumped the river, found both keys to open the gates, and driven the bike down across the quicksand to reach the hill. So now, either way, near the hill and back across the river, there's an opportunity to climb some rocks along the top of the waterfall and make a couple daring jumps to a ledge above the pool holding a secret. At the bottom of the waterfall, in one more Tomb Raider 1 throwback, we enter the cave hidden behind it. In the caves of Kalia, we now descend into a dark den of vipers. This is a green hell, but as there are no secrets and meager collectibles, we might as well take the most direct route straight out of here. 
The rest of the place is rife with traps and trial and error. From this hole, a drop to the bottom floor lands us amongst enemies, but there is only a straight path to the ancient evil being, this dude named Tony floating in his little pond. He is quickly possessed by the ancient powers of Kalia, making him more than just a dude. But Lara is more than a woman, so she's going to rock the boat. We recover the stone. Now we see something new, a globe, with the ability to select our next destination, Nevada, London, or the South Pacific. For first-time players, have fun! Since we know what's coming, let's deal with the trials of the desert first. Change of scenery, change of outfit, change of attitude. Not the preferred camo pattern, of course. Past this big canyon, the first secret is another one I dislike, where we need to once again drop into normally fatal terrain just so in order to survive. Through the cave, we find ourselves high amongst the mesas, with a building where an F-117 Nighthawk buzzes by while we traverse among the cliff paths, a teaser for what's to come. At the far end is a drop leading across the canyon and back into the open roof of the building. From the well we fall into, we can swim around to exit near another canyon. There's a secret along this outcropping if we jump to the handholds and drop down. There's also a lot of goodies along the riverbed. There's another route back up the canyon from the water, and this time we don't drop down to the secret, but instead continue up to more death-defying jumps, and another Nighthawk. The TNT detonator here can't be used yet, but the handholds nearby allow us to reach the top of the waterfall and shimmy into the cave. Upstream is a power station, with a simple secret nearby if we crawl under this outcropping and climb up. The water wheel is also climbable, and the dry channel at the top leads to a flooded dam, which is defended by the local wildlife. Below the sluice is an underwater lever opening a tunnel with two more levers along the way to the sluice control system, where we can get the water wheel turning again. When we return back to it, the detonator switch awaits in the newly lowered elevator. Now it's time to return to the TNT detonator and trigger it, but we gotta watch for the resulting boulder coming our way. The TNT blows open a path to a military installation beyond. Through the big hole in the cave wall is a flooded pool with two levers to pull. One opens this shack down through the open cave housing a water control switch. With it, we can flood the big water tank accessible over here, providing a route over the facility fence. In the large warehouse is our old friend, Quad Bike. We need to ride the bike onto the roof to get the card key up here, because of course, the card opens the power room inside the office to turn off the electric fence, and we are then free to open said fence, drive the quad bike down through the cave, leap over the barbed wire, and critically injure ourselves. Now, like Natla's mines in the offshore rig before, we lose our weapons, thus the incentive to do Nevada first. They didn't put a button in our cell this time, but they do have overzealous guards who come in if we sit on the windowsill, and they don't know how to stop us by running right by. Outside, in Bay C, we can start a good old prison riot by opening the other cells. Along the far wall is an already open cell with a movable box leading to a tunnel. At the other end, after moving a couple more boxes out of the way, is a secret. Through a hole in the roof is a long ditch with a switch at the far end. It opens a trapdoor down this ladder, leading us back to the facility, and past the MP here we can open the door for our rioters to assist. When the MP goes down, his Type A keycard will open the hall to Bay D. Through the restrooms are more boxes and a tank. We arrange them such that we can climb up into the maintenance hatch and hit another switch, flooding the tank and providing access to another hatch. Back outside again, at the end of a long corridor we can drop down and turn off some burners in the kitchen and open a door. The kitchen is back near the hatch, and now we can open a bunch of doors and connect back with our pals again for the next MP. The switch near him will adjust the kitchen fans, giving us a path back to where a dark crawl space leads to a long climb. Here, in Bay E, up a mesh ladder, we can go back outside and follow a very long route down to more cells. This MP drops the Type B keycard for accessing the computer room switch. Dropping down here, we can open both doors and sick all the prisoners we've met on the loose all at once, and that gets us the yellow security pass and access to the hangar. We can evade the guard with the crawl space, and this room, Lara goes full solid snake to reach the exit lever. We're now back in the upper levels of Bay C, with a spiral ramp leading to a spiral tunnel leading to the control room. After we turn on the radar array, we can leave, climb down the spiral ramp again, and now fall all the way down to a central pool. With some careful jumps around the perimeter, we can escape down a long Nostromo tunnel to a lever, return to the pool, and follow an underwater tunnel over some circuit boards to another tunnel. At the top of this ladder, we can cross back over the pool and climb up a ramp. Around the corner, we can claim a second yellow security pass, usable back near the ladder near some windows to block off a pool fan and provide access to a maintenance tunnel. At the end of a long swim, terminating in a lever, we can catch our breath and eventually arrive behind some glass in Bay C, where we finally recollect our pistols and a Desert Eagle. By shooting the gun turret an absurd number of times with our pistol, we can knock it down safely, and back down these two long swims, we can go back to the bay, armed and ready. 
The MP up here can't be reached with prisoners, but now we can get his Type B key card and claim a secret over here, then swim all the way back. At the top of this very long ramp, we can shoot our way out and get a blue security pass, climb to the access hall and use it to open the main gate, and start a conveyor belt. It'll move a box down here so we can reach the catwalk, hang and climb across to another catwalk, and get a yellow security pass from the MP up top where we can open the gate to Bay X. Out here, we just need to clear the area and climb in the truck. Area 51. Down near the gun locker is some heavy weaponry in the form of an MP5, and then we appropriately begin our infiltration in the vents. Past the Mission Impossible lasers out in the hall, we can free another prisoner, because Area 51 has inmates here, and head through another vent past a gun turret to a windowed walkway with a trapdoor at the end that drops us outside. There's a trench in the center here where we can drop down and find a switch to pull for a trapdoor. There's also a secret down here if we kill the guards fast enough before they can seal it off. All the way down in the hallway, we want to find another vent. There's a lot of crawling in this level. And continue to find a button. Further down the hallway is a second button, and at the bottom, past an ambush, we can make it to a long ascending ramp with emergency lights pulsing. This eventually leads to a missile silo, with the missile idling on the launch pad, so of course Lara's gonna go in and climb around. The guard up here drops a code clearance disc. Going down and then back up, we can make our way to a large flight control room where the disc is needed. Missiles are hoisted, and we break into an air vent nearby and drop down for another secret. Next, we dodge a wild hook, climb the middle ladder, and acquire the hangar access key from the MP. Back at the rocket ground floor, the access key goes at the end of a long tunnel. Inside is some kind of rail system with a ladder nearby for an inconvenient room calling the train car. We need to carefully crawl under the high voltage rail, make our way onto the train, and up into the vents again. Here we do a Crash Bandicoot impression, swinging around some lasers before we arrive at another train platform. Up the tunnel here we arrive at the hangar itself. Turns out it's not for F-117s. Around the perimeter is Central Command. There are two buttons on the upper catwalks that are on timers to open access to the dreaded Room of Switches. Hit them all if you want, these three are the ones that matter, and head back to the hangar entrance. We can then approach the craft. But we can't get in. There's a ladder off in the corner, so we need to climb up and jump around the gantry to get the launch code pass some clumsy MP dropped atop the saucer. We then tote that all the way back to the missile, all the way back, open the blast door, and insert our launch code pass and hit the big red button. We then want to promptly retreat the 20 or so feet necessary to escape a launching space missile's liftoff ignition. Now, the missile's gone, and we can reach the top of the silo, have another laser encounter, and make our way outside near a guard tower. That guy up top has another code clearance disc, and a lever in the room lets us drop down past more lasers to get back to the hall. The other code clearance disc lets us get into the alien autopsy room, which hopefully is fine without a mask or anything, Lara. We can also go for the final secret, back up the corner ladder across the gantry. Down this side tunnel we can actually drop into the quite unexpected orca tank for the final secret, and many unanswerable questions. The saucer is now open, so let's head into the internal plexus. We don't get to blast any aliens, unfortunately, but we do get to look around before we liberate Element 115 and presumably kill various other service people on our way out of the building. Whew. After all that claustrophobia, let's head somewhere a little more open next. From desert to tropics, we begin with a swim. Before emerging, let's find the smuggler's key in the water. And from a rock out in the lagoon, there's a mossy platform we can reach leading to a secret after a couple long jumps. There's a hut on the beach with a trap door our key opens leading down to a trapped hallway and a croc infested cave. In this cave we can hop over a trap to climb to new heights and make our way over to a foggy canyon with a bridge. On the right a short series of jumps leads to another secret and there's also an alternate route this way, one of several in the level, that I'll go over at the end. Beyond the canyon bridge lies a sinister Halloween temple. The button over here will disable the Indiana Jones light beam trap so we can jump the flowing water and begin our descent to the village. Along the far side of the village, if we make our way to this hut, we come across the controls to cover a bamboo pit. Across it is more village. Around the back of this hut is a third secret alcove. In another hut is a pulley that can be found, and by climbing this ladder we can follow the temple around to the hut rooftops. Up here is an eventual swinging segment over everything with a hut button at the end. That will raise a path over some burners to another button in the temple, and the pulley lets us out. Finally, a gate in this pool is open, past crocs and more jumps is our final destination. So at that first spooky temple, or down in the fog canyon before it, we could have dropped down into this side area instead of sliding down to the village. This area involves finding three serpent stones to progress, and there's an additional secret here as well. The crash site is full of fun set pieces, beginning with an actual diegetic map in our inventory to refer to for this crossing of the quicksand swamp. 
Near the far side is a sort of optical illusion secret hidden in plain sight on the cliff wall here. Next is a long, foggy valley with a velociraptor encounter, letting us know once again it's dino time. Along the trees and through a pit, a larger pack of raptors attack in the forest, and afterwards a branch above the canopy holds a secret. Since the Lost World had come out by now, this dino level also features little green copies down here at the bottom of a large dirt hill. In the center of the flooded cave basin is Commander Bishop. Turns out he's the T-Rex's dinner, and his key was supposed to be the dessert, because Rex is not looking happy when we go to leave. There are two levers scattered in small nooks around the Rex nest to open the exit, which we can do without any killing if we so choose. Back up the hill, it's time to explore the actual crash site. This side room over here is just an ambush trap the compies have set for us so we can ignore it. There's a man versus nature war going on behind the plane itself, and we don't have to pick sides. Through a cave near the dangerous stream, we can climb the roots over here to fight a couple deadly tree raptors on our way to another tree secret. The lever we need to pull is down in the water, so we need to shoot down this trapped raptor corpse to distract the piranhas before we go for it. Next is a nightmarish dark room full of raptors who flock around to chomp us as we pull the three switches to open a ceiling trap door. Up here is Lieutenant Tuckerman and an attendant key. With both keys, we can head back to the plane, get on top of it, and drop in. There's also a more complicated movement sequence to reach this cave with five switches, but it's completely optional and it's kind of a headache, so I'm not going to do it. In the plane, we insert both keys in the cockpit and open the doors to drop down and deploy the mounted turret. I don't think that's how it really works. But after that, well, a picture is worth a thousand words. Lara could be in serious PR trouble if footage of this ever leaks, by the way. After the bloodbath, we blast open the crumbling walls across the river and take our leave. If you saw kayaking on the back of the box and thought, that looks fun, big mistake. First off, there's lizard guys now. Off the cliff, we can drop down to a rock in the middle of the rapids and make our way down to the flat rocks with a gate button. Some handholds get us back across, and a couple shimmies lead to this long descending cave where we can open a gate, cross and continue upwards, and stop off in the waterfall cave over here for a secret with a roundabout escape. Further up the cliffs, we can find a kind of ridiculous second secret by jumping over the slope towards this hut downriver. Another tricky one to get back from. Down in the cave is our kayak, the lever for the gates underwater, and here we go. The kayak is super slippery, which combined with the inexorable current makes steering quite difficult. We want to ideally avoid the rocks as we drop down the falls and follow the chute, avoiding red trap ropes if we see them. It's quite a long trip down, and at the bottom there's a large anchor set into the lake. If you have a few minutes, by slowly fighting up the current and paddling our way upstream here, we can reach a secret cave hidden under a nearby waterfall. Up the rapids, from the anchor we can discover this room, connecting to a ceiling system over the plug and swinging across the cave tunnel path past fire-breathing statues, of course. A rocket launcher's in here, and a road to a lovely cavern above that secret cave with a climbing route above the crest of the waterfall left and then right. At the top, we can climb past some stream spikes and up the rapids to a long ladder, four boulder traps up the slopes, and more spelunking. By climbing all the rapids on foot, we can eventually jump to a long zip line above the anchor chain, and if we climb up and backflip, we can retract the chain and turn the pool into a giant whirlpool vortex. After all that, we just gotta return to our kayak and carefully drop through the vortex into the pool below. With one last underwater lever, we can open our ticket out of here. Similar to India, the Temple of Pune is an abbreviated boss level to end the region. Up these stairs along the cutback, we can crawl into the pizza cutter bowl and hopefully move gracefully from side to side through the blades as we hit all four switches. Down the slope, the ceiling begins to descend. There are three switches, but it's a red herring because we don't have time to pull them before the sweet crush of death, so instead we pull a block out first to stop the descent. From there you'll notice the large boulder. Hit the lever under it and run run run. We'll have to hang a right halfway to escape completely, and for whatever reason that opens a secret door back in a place we'd otherwise not need to revisit. Hmm. Otherwise, the slide to approach the boss is now open. The fight doesn't start until we approach the throne, which is nice of them, and then we have some lightning to dodge. And then we collect the aura dagger. All that's left, a trip to the old smoke. I guess Lara parachutes in or something because once again we start at the top. By jumping backwards over the slope to an obscure drop floor, we can reach a crane and drop down several times to find it through barbed wire. And yeah, you gotta climb back up. Also, PlayStation Jam Pack purchasers will know that we can actually jump to the end of the level from this crane and skip everything. So back on the starting catwalk, the only safe movement is off the side where the camera helps us spot a button we need to go for. The high visibility ledge it raises will point us across the way. It just so happens the overhead mesh leads to a zip line so that we can slide neatly over and drop catch to reach it. 
The switch nearby will drop the ledge back down for later. Inside the building, across ratty rickety rafters, is a strongman with the flu room key. We need to take an alternate route back across by hanging and dropping to a button and then making our way down to the floor. Another button down here opens the top of a ladder back to the entrance. We need to get back across, but again we need to go down and then back up to get there. Down one level from here is a well-hidden secret with three alcoves and an invisible seam between them that we can shimmy along. The way forward is through the alcove centered on the platform itself, and we need to do some air duct infiltration over to a back alley with more platforms. A button here unveils a more precious button later, and then we can return to the main area and slide down to the ground. Among other things, down here we can find a series of ladders all the way back up to the starting scaffold. There's another different route to take, this time along the alley and along another subtle wall crack. Around and up, it'll take us through another passage where the precious button awaits above. That moves the window washing platform we saw earlier, and we can reach it near the passage and find the lock for our flu room key we cleverly got first. There's a button in the dark here, and to get out afterwards we need to stop and go through some flames. Outside, we climb all the way down and all the way up one more time to head across to the far rooftops. There's a secret over here beyond the slope, and down a drop leading several long slopes down all the way around, we can drop into the building with a button that makes the world's loudest noise again, and raises some water over here. In the big pool at the far end is an underwater lever that opens a floor gate, but before proceeding we should go back and lower the water again. Through the gate, and swimming carefully along the large turbines, we can emerge to find a crawl space through the tunnel. Along there and dropping down we encounter a large tunnel boring machine, so we need to sprint along the hall and around to the left to avoid it once, and then time our passage with this little alcove so it passes us harmlessly. The box in the alcove can then be pulled out to block the machine while we painstakingly move it along the track. Once we push it far enough to short the circuit, the machine stops and we can climb back up to the upper floor and use the second precious button. Before we drop down the hole though, we can raise the water level again to reach a ledge on the left of the pool room and from there go through the next pool room to uncover a third precious button. We need to hang and monkey swing back across the water to get back to the big tank and from there the third precious button. We summon the sound again and return to the second pool, down through the trap door and along a dark tunnel all the way to an ornate room straight out of Vagrant Story. Atop a tall ladder and through barbed wire, we find ourselves near the crane from early on, and we can carefully jump through barbed wire again to make our way to the rooftop. Inside the building is a block to pull, and we can climb up to the second floor for a secret, and then, on the far side of the bell tower, down a few drops, is another late secret. Whether or not we collect them, the end of the level is through the open fencing near the bell tower. Aldwich, in which we must embrace the underground. If you thought Thames was dreary, buckle up. Right away, there's a missable shotgun cache found by jumping off the slope, but it isn't a secret. From the water, we find some ascending stairs with a climbable shaft behind a breakable window that leads to some girders and a movable box. The box can be arranged so that we can drop down into a ticketing area below and use it to climb to some higher ducts that eventually land us inside the ticket booth. There's a maintenance key on the ground which we can take down the escalator and carefully across the tracks to its lock. In here, a button restores the station power. At the other end of the platform is an old penny for good luck. Now comes a part you may remember where Lara has to play chicken with oncoming subway trains to make this red room in time. Via a sequence of acrobatics, slope jump here, up and back flip off the ladder, monkey swing around and drop, will emerge to even more looming death. A spinning drill pursues us down the tunnel which consists of several ledges and collapsing platforms breaking up a long fall. Near the bottom of this madness is a secret we need to anticipate in order to catch, but the drill doesn't come down this far even though the music is still rushing us. From the bottom we need to climb down another fairly vertical shaft to reach a tiled room with burners. There's just enough room to stand and plan a jump up through the gap in the flames, and above a tight jump to a ladder yields a button that opens a trap door. Atop the ladder, crawling under a new burner leads up and out. Through a hole in the mesh we return to the tracks and from there, the red room, so we can cross to the top of the drill bit from just a moment ago to find Solomon's key. So we loop back around to the red room again, and now we go through. In the corner here is a collapsing tile with a mini puzzle to reach another tiled hallway over here with a pair of buttons, each controlling doors near the pool around the corner. The right button opens these two rooms, and both offer a button followed by a long return to the start. The left opens the nearer door, which we want to do last. There are monkey bars over to another Solomon's key. Swimming through the puddle here leads all the way back to the ticket station, and with our old penny we can get a ticket. We're now ready to head down to the other platform, hiding an easy to miss secret behind this breakable window slash poster. Another tunnel run, this time with the added drama of this dude getting involved in shutting the nearest door, and we can use this button to open the other two doors and continue along. Now we have a weird little temple with a truly obnoxious button puzzle. Our goal is to get back to the temple's inner sanctums so that we can use our Solomon's keys to drop the ceremonial swords and get the Masonic mallet, watching for traps as well as the ornate star in a hole over here. 
In the corner room we opened is a pool leading to an old shaft with some interesting movement to get across the fence and up over to a random ticket booth for the ticket I really hope you got. From here we can use our star to get a secret back here, the first instance of a key just for a secret in Tomb Raider. Down the escalator past the booth is a place for our Masonic mallet and a button. Directly overhead here is a simple little secret. Then all the way down through the dark tunnel we can find another platform to an old train car. We need to take a roundabout way to actually get into the car by dropping down the gap in the tunnel and crawling up from underneath. Inside is another button to open a different tunnel out. Up ahead is another unique secret with an enemy who jump scares us, but he doesn't attack. Instead, he runs away with his torch. We need to let him get far enough along to trigger this door before we take him out or it'll lock us out. Inside, the two buttons open gates in the car and way back here. And no, there's no shortcut back through the train car, the tunnel, and the red room and back. If it helps, the exit's just right here. Similar to the Tibetan monks in Tomb Raider 2, the cult members are now our friends here, so be nice. We follow another torchbearer down to a pool room where we want to go left for the first secret. We need to dodge a spike ceiling down here before hang dropping down a cliff face to find it to the bottom. We can then return just past the pool room middle door. Further along, another secret awaits about halfway up the long ladder climb past a backflip. At the very top, we get access into the museum via a ceiling duct. We can drop down into a security room before pulling the box, which opens the door leading outside for some reason. Through here, we're, I guess, climbing the exhibits. So we can move another box to climb through the ceiling and drop into another room full of platforms. There are two switches we must reach in order to prepare a ladder sufficient to reach the top where the embalming fluid awaits. Through the passage behind it are a couple more guards who just want to get home to their families, and beyond the door is a drop to our old friend, a sphinx. There's a fun secret way off to the side of the room via a jump across to a conspicuous slope. Down by the Sphinx's feet are some ornate stairs in the corner with a little jump at the top to a ladder crate, and another little hop to a secret above. Our ladder takes us through the vents again, and we need to push and pull two more ladder crates to continue our climb. Finally, after all that, we're back in the Colt's pool room. Put the fluid over this alcove to open a long shaft down to a one-manned underwater propulsion vehicle, a UPV. In the big cavern, we can zip around, shoot some crocs, and collect stuff, but once we ascend the brick tunnel, we can't return. We ditch the UPV and swim ahead to find an underwater lever opening an overhead exit to a button and an interesting little setup revisiting the stealth bits from Nevada. Down in the adjoining pool is a lever through a hole in the floor and a secret through a nearby hole in the wall. We don't want the guard here to spot us. We want to swim and crawl along a low route where we can make our way to the back of the room and we can take out the resistance before they can seal off the door to the next secret here. In the midst of all this, the other guard dropped his boiler room key. We have one final nightmarish bit here, the underwater cube maze. 16 openings all around. A lever over here opens a door up here, which subsequently opens a door over here, which subsequently opens a door over here, which opens an extremely long swim back to the surface that probably should have had some kind of decompression stop. This trap makes me laugh because the trick is just to fall into the water and turn off the burners, unlike similar previous traps, but the pistons beyond erase that happiness. Past those are a monkey swing through a waterfall where we can finally use our extremely convenient boiler room key to open a door back down in the depths. With our UPV, we go way down, back through, way up, and through the giant swinging sextants to a dark winding climb ultimately leading us across an elevator shaft and through the vent, where we can strike at the heart of our enemy. Sophia. Who's she? What does she do? I don't know! Climb, monkey swing, button, secret, back up past the trapdoor, across the bridge and climb, crawl, climb up and long jump, shoot the circuit box, jump back over, turn off the power, get it. That's all four artifacts, and now it's time to go where it all started. Unlike Tomb Raider 2's Tibet, here the game actually acknowledges cold weather, and we rapidly lose meter even treading at the surface, so we can't swim for very long. Lara still instantly dries off, at least. From the island, we can reach the main glacier. There are some items scattered around, but our main goal is to make our way to the bow of the ship, where this ice wall and some handholds allow us to get on the deck. Inside, we can hit a button, pull a lever, and hit another button, these are all to distribute the enemy encounters, I think, and find a final button to deploy an inflatable raft mounted on the stern. Back outside before disembarking, we can follow the deck around to a side cave with a secret below. From there, we can either carefully or recklessly descend to the raft and climb in. Now we can loop around the boat and proceed up the river. Halfway along is a cave with a small opening with a second secret past a long, crawling tunnel. At the other end, we encounter the legs of a large man-made structure. By climbing up and using them as monkey bars, we can reach the secluded back half of the structure. The power's out, so nothing works yet, but past guards and dogs, we encounter malfunctioning doors to some kind of field office, and within its depths is our prize, the crowbar. Note this fun little island map in the corner of the office. 
Back outside, we can now climb on the roof of the facility and use our crowbar to jimmy open the barred door, where the nearby button opens a trap door for us. By swinging over and dropping down, we can discover the fuel valve diagram we'll need shortly. You can also skip this part if you somehow already know the valve configurations needed. Following the descending fuel pipes is a claustrophobic drop into a cold pool, leading to the water pump system underground. By alternating the valves, pulling number 2 and 4, we can get the generator door open again, allowing us to climb up and turn on the generator. With the power on, these buttons will open the doors to the main buildings for us, where we can basically visit the set of the thing. To the right is an ominously destroyed cafeteria, and around the back is a dog kennel we can unlock to get the gate control key past a pack of untended huskies, who are, unfortunately, all attack dogs. Through an icy passage off the kennel, we can return to the fuel station, and from there make our way to the boat. Nearby, we can redeploy our crowbar to reach the gate controls and open the waterway. Now the end of the level is just ahead, but once again we have the opportunity to find a hidden hut key in a sunken cave down here and motor all the way back to the unmissable hut at the start of the level. It's nothing special though. Further along is one final lodge and the finish line. What a bright, cheerful level. And now we descend into another hell, a man-made labyrinth of iron and mutated beast punctuated by minecart madness. We frantically follow an endless spinning hallway for hours until we realize that we need to turn around and find the hidden hallway when the doors close behind us. We'll crawl through a vent shaft to reach a long drop with a flamethrower guy in the snow at the bottom and some truly creepy new mutant enemies. Past them we can get our first taste of the rail system. There's a minecart nearby we can hop in and ride uphill and down. The track is very poorly maintained and we'll have to break at some corners, but eventually we reach a stop with more ongoing violence. Past the drills through a snowy slide is an ice cave populated with fully grown mutants. Through a crawl space along the wall is an open space with a crowbar on the catwalk and a nigh invisible crack on the wall we can use to reach a button. Across the precarious stalagmites we sneak past more drills and ice shaving machines until we finally return to the minecart. Ride number two loops us back to the starting point. Now with our crowbar we can pry open the door and get a lead acid battery. We can also go two for one on secrets. In this control room we can get on the roof, hang off the far side and find a ladder down, and backflip over to a high cubby hole. The button we hit earlier opens up a second secret immediately after. And, while we're down here, the next minecart is, too. It's critical for us to hit the railroad switch, lest we careen into a dead end. Along ride number three, ducking under some crossbeams, we arrive at a stop above water. In here, we want to circle around and slide down, follow the dark, steamy paths to a crawl space underneath the tracks, and make our way to a ladder up past buttons to a control room. In the building are two buttons, and in the water is a winch starter. We can then head back to our cart for ride number four. When we get back, we take the highest level minecart. In the large destination pool, we can use the battery and the starter to start the winch. That'll lower the diving bell, and we need to carefully swim down to it given the water temperature. There are caves on the side to warm up, quote unquote, and once we hit the underside of the bell, we're now able to take the final plunge down into a flooded funnel. After one more rest, we've reached our destination. Out here we see the looming partial excavation of an ancient ruin, also some Maui heads. A final secret is hidden down a slope at the bottom of the snow leading to some fun jumps along the bottomless canyon. Across the bridge up here, we can open the forbidden door. Before there was Atlantis, then there was the Temple of Jean, now there is Tinos, the final hurdle. This first room just has a long path around to a second floor where we open the door to find an Uli key. To find a Uli key? Not sure, but it goes right over here. Up top are a few more switches, we need to only pull two of which is, and then head to a room with five buttons. My interpretation of these clue symbols was kind of a natural hierarchy thing, with man at the top of the chain above animals and animals above plants, and birds above land animals above fish. So 1, 2, and 5 are valid hierarchies, but 3 and 4 aren't. It's a little bit of a stretch though. But 1, 2, 5 will get us through the door into the big hall below. Now the weird endgame Tomb Raider stuff increases with big green dragonflies coming to say hi. There are a lot of them, probably to help us spot the invisible platforms across the sky leading to a secret nearby. Around the collapsed bridge are some especially nasty mutants and swinging urns. Here's a central area with four doors corresponding to themed challenges, a bit like the Folly in Tomb Raider 1, and we can do them in whatever order we want. At the far end is a path up into the rafters, and beyond that is another trial by quicksand. There are some climbable rocks to help us along as we try not to drown, and eventually climb out near a little corner to pull a lever and find a way to an altar with an oceanic mask. Water. We drop into a room with blades above and below, and we must swim down a long tunnel to a puzzle. There's a lever through the upper left hole that opens a door on the right, not much room for trial and error here. Past more sets of blades is another lever on the upper right, opening the final path to the mask. A sunken lever over here opens the return path. Fire. There's a really cool hint on this fiery block that unveils itself with a flare, showing us where we can stand on the burning pillars. 
On the other side, a trapdoor will drop us into a fiery hell with these amazing living snake statues breathing fire over more invisible pillars. The lever on the side here turns one of the heads off, and we find another mask inside the gate. The hall in the corner takes us back. Wind. This is just a straight-up labyrinth in the dark. Here's the layout. There's a constant wind noise playing in this maze, and if we stand still, Lara's hair braid will flutter in the breeze and we can go in the direction the wind is coming from. In the end, we have four spiked barrels to dodge on our way up to the final mask and a drop down to the doors. Now that we have all four masks, we can enjoy not being done yet because another Yuli key is required. In this lower side room is a trap with giant mutants, a lower lever, and a path on the second floor back outside. We carefully jump past swinging pots to reach two higher levers, pull them, and make our way down to the large room with another lever raising the platform to reach another lever, back up here to unpull the lever we started with, these are just adjusting these metal platforms by the way, and monkey swing under here to find the final lever. Across the shallow pools dwell a few more mutants and our key. Back in the light beam room we can pull a block over here to reach a ladder up to this pretty easy secret. Now before we leave, the final secret in the game, it's a doozy. Back in the horrible room of flipping ledges, we pull a two minute timed lever here to open a door way over here, and must follow a precise path back through the light beam, pots, and down off the bridge to get there just in time. Now we just put the oceanic masks in the dais around the light beam and jump through. It's time to face the final boss. It's not really a level, also it's pretty annoying. We shoot the spider until he stops moving, sprint to a crystal, sprint back, repeat times four. At that point, the meteor drops into the ooze, and he finally is truly vulnerable. Once he explodes, we climb up and swing across, make our way up out of the crater, and fight past a few final foes to a button opening the gate to the helicopter and its unfortunate pilot. Game over. Now if you aren't aware, there is for the first time a secret level we unlock if we find all 59 or 60 secrets in the game. Unfortunately, it's another London level. It's pretty short though. We need to get inside first by climbing all the way up all this business in the alley. There's a bat jump scare right before to set the mood as we make our way into the broken ceiling tile and drop in. Inside, it's pretty much one big room. A lever over here opens a door down in the corner. Deploying a ladder, we can swing back over and climb up the bookshelves to reach more levers. From the alcove, we want to swing up by the stained glass windows, find a vault key, and zip line over the spikes. From here, we can angle jump to a weird little rotating bookshelf and swing over more unpleasantness. Past a water piston is a well-guarded button, and we can climb back up to drop back down. There's a well-hidden lever behind this breakable window, and the vault key opens the vault door, leading to the sewers or something. We nervously swim past the horrible floating bodies to a lone guard and his dog deep underground, and climb up to a central chamber where the game fittingly concludes with a pile of bullets. I did make videos like this for Tomb Raider 1 and 2, and I'm going to circle back to check out some of the DLC for the first three games next. Thanks for watching. Thank you.